Good morning, everyone. It is Friday, April 7th. Welcome to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Brad Smith alongside Shauna Smith and Brian Sazi. Happy Jobs Day to all of you watching and everyone here on the desk as well. We've got a lot to discuss here, even as we are waiting for these numbers to cross. That comes at 8.30 a.m. Eastern Time. We're just about five minutes out from that point here, and we've all been waiting for exactly where this report comes in, especially on the backs of some of the other economic data that's come through over the course of this week, Shauna. Yeah, certainly, Brad. And we, we're starting to see maybe some signs of cooling here within the labor market. We got the jolt stat out earlier this week, the ADP print, both lower than expected here. The ADP print coming in 145,000, well below what the street was looking for. We also had that jolt data, job openings below 10 million, just below it though, 9.9 .9 million, the lowest level that we have seen since May of 2021. So some signs that demand is moving maybe more in line with supply. Although of course you can argue that we have a ways to go in order for it really to uh, materially maybe impact the inflation fight in the long run there. Yeah, so. this is, uh, I don't think how the bulls or what the bulls wanted to see to kick off April. ISM yeah. missed, JOLTS missed, uh, various economic uh, data, data indicators we track here, Yahoo Finance also missed. Disappointing start to the end. I, uh, I am watching this chart here. Uh, let's throw that on the screen here. Looking at really the increase in interest rates uh, alongside GDP. And I think this is very important to keep in mind as we get this jobs dump number coming out. Uh, the Federal Reserve has aggressively raised interest rates over the past year, and that is starting to influence GDP, starting to influence the job market, I think. And as you start to pick apart this jobs report, guys, I think you need to keep, of course, in the backdrop what all of this means to Federal Reserve policy. You know, one of the charts that I've been keeping a close eye on here is labor force participation. And that labor force participation rate, uh, we had seen that in the previous month come in at 62.5%. Now, particularly, one thing that we should also note is that there was some interesting data that had actually come out that talked about the participation rate actually being higher than the pre-pandemic level after adjusting for aging and excess retirements. And so with the examination of some of the retirements within age groups in more detail, it suggests that the retirement shares by age group have risen only modestly. But all of this considered, if we did see a real labor force participation rate that is actually higher than that pre-pandemic, then it could issue for the Fed or at least signal for the Fed that there's still a lot of strength for them to be continuing with their policy pathway forward at this point in time. And that's something for us to continue to keep an eye on where this ticks either upwards or downwards in this coming report here today. Yeah, certainly. And it's also going to be interesting once we dig into the sectors and see what sectors are hiring and what sectors uh, we're seeing some job reduction there. When we take a look at the ADP, ADP print within the private payroll sector, the wage growth there coming from leisure, hospitality, no real surprise. Construction also making up a bulk of that hiring. Wage growth obviously will be a huge focal point within this report. The expectation there month over month, again, of just about three tenths of a percent year over year, 4.3 percent. That would be down from the prior print that we got of 4.6 percent. But of course, the big question is what this print is going to mean to the Fed, how Jay Powell, the rest of the Fed officials are going to be looking at this print and whether or not it's enough to maybe do one more hike mm -hmm. and then keep it there for a little bit. Not to get uh, completely wonky and, and hopefully not boring. Against the backdrop of, of, backdrop of this report, let's zoom out and think some longer term uh, things here. That is AI. We've been talking about AI a lot over the past two months and the stocks and the movements. And let's keep in mind that all this move, this move towards new levels of artificial intelligence is likely to impact the job market in some manner. Is it this report? No. Is it the next one? Next one? No. But that is also an undercurrent to a lot of the companies that I talk to, a lot of the executives that I talk to. Uh, they are figuring out how th can they use this new level of artificial intelligence to require less workers. And I look right. at Walmart Investor Day uh, this week. They came out with a beautiful new facility, automation, 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 fuel workers. And think about the areas that that would start to show up in these figures. Even as we were thinking about some of the ADP data, manufacturing down 30,000 jobs in the most recent month. No doubt, artificial intelligence, robotics, hand in hand, and in the manufacturing processes, you could easily see where that could take on a role in the future. Even in financial activities and some professional and business services, those jobs could be at risk if there is more of an artificial intelligence or at least a generative AI layering in to some of the existing responsibilities in the name of improving productivity at the end of the day. So even as we are coming up to the 8.30 a.m. marker, let's just remind of 
where we're expecting the jobs to come in at. 230,000 is the figure that we were expecting here, and that is the estimate. And as we are starting to get some of the numbers here this morning at the 8.30 a.m. marker, what you need to know is that ultimately, at the end of the day, one of the figures that we're going to also watch is the unemployment rate figure, and particularly that expected to come in at 3.6%. We're starting to get some of those figures to come in, and 236,000 jobs were added. So that is above the expectation of 230,000 jobs. And then additionally here, taking a look at the unemployment rate, that coming in at 3.5%. The expectation there was for it to be at 3.6% on the unemployment rate front. And then also taking a look through some of the other data. Average hourly earnings year over year, that coming in at 4.2%. The expectation there was 4.3%. So all of this considered, you got a beat on the payroll headline number. You got a beat on unemployment rate as well. And then a slight miss on where the average year over year for the hourly earnings would be. But all of this considered, uh, interesting to see this data continue to come in. Again, there you're taking a look at the actuals versus the estimates, a beat on non-farm payrolls, a beat on unemployment rate, um, that coming in better than expected. Um, and now the question shifts towards, okay, if you're Fed Chair Jay Powell sitting at home and you're lazy boy drinking some peppermint tea this morning. Peppermint tea. Peppermint okay, tea. All right. Why yeah. not? With some lemon in it. At the end of the day, what do you do with this data? This is going to be the last report before the last jobs report before their next meeting as well. Well, here, here's what I here's what I quickly jotted down on on, on my notes. Uh, likely another rate hike from the Fed, potentially a continuation of the slowing economic data or surprisingly slowing economic data we have been getting to kick off April. That is my initial decoding. Uh, of course, lot, lots more takeaways to come. Yeah, certainly we're seeing the dollar rise just a bit after this print. You would, th you would have to think that the Fed is looking at this. Not enough progress here in terms of the slowdown that they would like to see within the job sector. We know that the jobs market has really been so resilient now for quite some time. The Fed has been waiting to see a little bit more weakness within the jobs print in order to really show some signs that the economy may be slowing more significantly, that we're making some more progress at the fight against inflation. But when you take a look at this number, yes, some improvement when you compare it to prior months, but still coming in above expectations, slightly above expectations, 236,000. Average hourly earnings, like Brad, you said there, three-tenths of a percent exactly in line with what the street was looking for. And just a little tidbit here as well. Employment continued to trend up. Leisure and hospitality there. Government, professional business business services and healthcare, some of those leading sectors. Joining us now, RSM Chief Economist Joe Brusuelas here in studio with us alongside John Hancock Investment Management Co-Chief Investment Strategist <laughs> Emily Rowland. Joe, I'll go to you first just because you're sitting to my right here. You'll read in on the data that just crossed on the employment situation. The Fed's going to hike its policy rate by 25 basis points when it meets in May. I think that's the primary takeaway. Look, a 3.5% unemployment rate pretty much status quo, a strong, albeit cooling job market. This is what you want to see, but it's not, it's necessary, but not sufficient for the Fed to actually declare, hey, a peak. Um, wages, what we were at 4.2 on a year ago basis, 0 0.3. I want to dig in a little deeper. I think we're going to have a three handle on a three month average annualized pace. That gives you a sense, I think, of where one, uh, the risk of a wage price spiral is, that means it's diminished. That's actually good. That means we will get a near-term top in that policy rate peak. Um, but look, demand's still stout for workers. We're short workers in all kinds of you know, uh, service industries. So we have a tight labor market. Inflation's cooling, but not cooling f uh, fast enough. Emily, what do you think? Do you agree the print coming in slightly above expectations? <laughs> Unemployment, 3.5%, really pointing to the fact that the labor market remains very tight. Yeah, Sean, absolutely. The U.S. labor market is undoubtedly the strongest pillar of the U.S. economy today. And in fact, we just beat expectations in the non-farm payrolls report for 12 months in a row. And that's a streak that dates all the way back to 2000. So no doubt about it. And we are seeing the bond market reprice expectations, as Joe mentioned, for what the Fed's going to do in May. We were looking at about a 50-50 uh, chance of another 25 basis point rate hike versus a hold in May. And now I'm looking at bond, the bond market expectations and 25 basis points is now the base case. I'm looking at the two-year Treasury yield this morning. We're up about 12 basis points. Another reflection that the Fed still has some work to do here. 
Emily, uh, we've seen, I would say, let's say over the past week or so, we've seen a rotation into more defensive areas of this market. Utility stocks, hot. Gold stocks, uh, hot. And gold itself, silver, hot. What is your read? Do those trades stay hot after this report, or do we see a rotation into riskier areas in the market next week? Yeah, I think those trades continue to make a lot of sense. We're also pairing more classically defensive areas of the market with quality. So we are in a very tricky part of the economic cycle. We're, we're in this almost never-ending late cycle environment right now where economic growth is clearly decelerating and the Fed is obviously continuing to tighten here, but the labor market is still resilient. Everybody has a job. Consumers are continuing to spend. So that means that we've got to be really thoughtful about risk management. We do see a recession likely unfolding in the back half of this year. So we want to emphasize parts of the market that can hold up well. Companies with great balance sheets, lots of cash, more durable profitability. We're de-emphasizing those sort of unprofitable growth at any price type parts of the market. We're also looking at high quality bonds. It's a great opportunity right now to reach for yield, generate income in a portfolio amidst a really challenging macro backdrop. Joe, labor force participation rate came in at 62.6 percent. Slight move higher there. If we do see a recession in the back half of the year, where does that figure start to fall to? All or right, so we to? have a tight labor market. We may have a recession, but the unemployment rate during this recession is not going to look like it did during the pandemic, mm. not going to look like it did to the great financial crisis, nor will it look like a recession in any of your lifetimes. Mm. I want to point that out. It's not going to 8%. We think it's something around 5% if we're in recession later in a half a year. Hey, look, as we've been able to get in the data, that three-month average annualized pace of wages is now 3.8%. If you look at weekly, it's 3.3%. That's actually a good sign if you're bullish for this market. That means the Fed really will, at, in, in a short period of time, be able to create a narrative whereby they can engage in a strategic pause. Brian, you're right. We're going to see a repricing of rate hikes. Those rate hikes, or excuse me, the rate cuts aren't going to happen this year, but maybe early next year. Let me, let me just hop in here, Joe, because if we get that next rate hike, like you're calling, yeah. are we again talking about a late April, early May a revival of this banking turmoil that we saw in March? No, I don't think 25 basis points is going to cause a revival of the banking turmoil. Look, there's 20 to 30 banks that are going to need policy attention or a private capital solution. That's already baked in the cake, right? As long as we don't have a large bank in Europe blow up, I think we're going to get through this. My personal opinion or my estimation is the worst of the panic is behind us, but banking crisis are slow moving beast and profoundly nonlinear. Brian, this is going to go on not for weeks or months, but for years. Mm. You know, the, the period of the last 15 years where we really haven't had banks failed, well, that's an era that's now in the rearview mirror. Going forward, there's going to be banks who are going to fail, and they should fail. And what we want to do is put in policy, put place policies that protect depositors, not just individuals, but the small and medium-sized enterprises that are the beating heart and soul of the American economy. Emily, how are you looking at the turmoil within the banking sector? How much of that has impacted or will impact hiring plans here moving forward? Yeah, it looks to be isolated for now, to Joe's point, to some banks that were poorly run and ran into solvency issues, which does typically happen when the Fed raises rates, something breaks. And, and we saw that in the banking sector and policymakers in Washington have put a lot of uh, firepower behind shoring up the banks. But we do continue to see liquidity as something that's a, a concern for us. So we look to um, you know, potentially other, you know, kind of cracks, whether it's areas like commercial real estate or, or, or other kind of highly levered parts of the market that may see some challenges ahead. So, you know, we do see this again as a period in which uh, we are likely to see the impact of or the lagged impact of Fed tightening ultimately pushing us towards a recession here. And we want to be really mindful of positioning for that. Um, you know, Joe mentioned things moving slowly. Right now, it feels like the, the things are moving slowly. We're seeing these kind of little cracks in the labor market, job openings coming down, still very elevated, but we're seeing that slow. Challenger layoff. Um, we're seeing that the most layoffs are up 300% over a year over year basis. Of course, many companies overhired, 15% uh, month over month in terms of the rise in layoffs. So this is happening. It's happening slowly. But once we start to see corporate margins really compressed, 
and companies are dealing with that margin pressure, they will start to lay off workers and it may happen quickly here. So we want to be patient. Patience is a virtue. And Emily, for investors that are perhaps not trying to fight the Fed, but anticipate the Fed as we talk about all the time, how can they best make sure that they're curtailing QT or, or quantitative tightening as a headwind <laughs> risk to their portfolio? Yeah, I mean, look, the bond market is still pricing in 100 basis points of rate cuts uh, for the remainder of this year. So we want to be mindful of that. That is that is reflected uh, in the price. It's helping areas like quality growth outperform here. Um, I, You know, and we think that that's right. Um, we think that the Fed is going to have to deal with rising unemployment. It's going to happen quickly towards the end of the year. Again, owning higher quality bonds, quality on the equity side, more defensive assets is really the name of the game today. All right, Emily Rowland, Joe Brusuelis, as always, great to have you guys here breaking down this jobs report. We want to Thank recap you. the numbers here. The big headline number, 236,000 jobs added to the U.S. economy last month. Unemployment ticking lower here at 3.5%. You're looking at average hourly wages here on a year-over-year -year basis, still up 4.2% on a month-over-month -month basis. We saw an increase of just about three-tenths of a percent. So that headline number, 236,000, coming in above the street's expectations, but it is a sign that growth is slowing just a bit. Coming up, why our next guest says that the credit crunch has started. We will speak with Apollo's Torsten Slaw next. All right, let's recap the jobs numbers here. 236,000 jobs added to the U.S. economy last month. Unemployment, 3.5%. Average hourly wages, a year-over-year -year basis, 4.2%. 236,000 jobs. That was a headline there. Some cooling here when you compare it to the prior month, which was over 300,000 there. Question, though, whether or not it's enough improvement for the Fed. Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery standing by at the Wi-Fi Interactive. And, Jared, we're seeing some movement here within the futures. Yes, we are. And as you can see, the Nasdaq down just slightly, uh, but the S&P 500 and then Dow slightly in the green. Not expecting a whole lot of movement today, and that's because the main markets are closed. We're just dealing with equity 
futures right now as well as bond market futures, but almost everything is going to get priced in on Monday. So this happens once every few years. Interesting scenario. But here's what we're working with. NASDAQ did spike up. We also saw a little bit of a dip here. And it's basically right back to where uh, we saw it right when the uh, report was getting dropped. And then if you take a look at the Dow, you can see it spiked up and it's holding on to some of those gains. But let me just show you what's happened over the last few days. This week, uh, just kind of a drop in the bucket given the week's range and not really making any waves here. Uh, let me take a look at the Treasury market as well. We do have Treasury futures open and it is not a bond market holiday. We do have the bond market open, so it'll be interesting to track that as well. And you can see the 10-year Treasury note futures heading uh, sharply down here. That means the rates are going up. And I think that's kind of pricing in the fact that we might get that 25 basis point hike in May. Those odds going up to two and three, two out of three that are being priced in in the swaps market right now. Also going to show you the two year Treasury note, and that is down by a little bit less. So we actually have the twos 10 spread. That's a yield curve getting more inverted than it was yesterday. So that's something to keep track of as well. And let me just uh, show you what happened this week. This is uh, what happened in the sector action. It's been very defensive. Utilities and healthcare, those were the two leading sectors. We'll have to see what gets priced in Monday, guys. All right, Yahoo Finance's own Jared Blickery breaking down some of the futures action plus some of this week's action as well. It's been interesting to track, Jared. Thanks so much. Also, everyone, the jobs report out this morning showcasing a resilient labor market that isn't slowing as much as the Fed would like to see. Let's take a step back and discuss why the jobs report matters for the Fed. Joining us now to break it all down, Yahoo Finance's own Jennifer Schoenberger. Jennifer. Floor is yours. Good morning, Brad. Good morning, Brad. The Federal Reserve closely takes into account the jobs report because officials believe the strength of the job market is feeding inflation higher, both in terms of sheer numbers and wage growth. If jobs growth remains too strong, the Fed will move to push rates higher to try to slow down job growth and bring down inflation. The Fed looks at inflation in three buckets. One, core goods price inflation, which which is the price of things like washing machines, two, shelter inflation, prices for rents and homes, and three, services inflation, excluding shelter. This is the one that tends to be closely tied to labor costs. It remains particularly elevated and will require wage pressures to ease more. Several officials have noted that wages need to grow at a slower level, more consistent with 2% inflation. Certainly, this report under scores that with above 4% wage growth. Now, inflation reflects a gap between supply and demand, resulting in pressures that fuel wage and price increases. In raising interest rates, the Fed intends to slow demand, cool a still hot job market, and bring demand and supply back into alignment. Stronger than expected jobs reports both in January and February pushed the Fed to move forward with raising rates a quarter percentage point at the March policy meeting, despite the turmoil in the banking sector. Now, the Fed has penciled in one more rate hike potentially for that May meeting that would bring the Fed funds rate to a range of five to five and a quarter from the current range of four and three quarters to five percent. Certainly, the Fed will take into account this jobs report as well as forthcoming information. There's still quite a bit of time between now and their May meeting. But, Brad, I just want to note anecdotally, I asked St. Louis Fed President Bullard on a call yesterday about that JOLTS report, which which was the latest data that we had coming into this jobs report. Uh, and that data, as you know, showed the biggest drop in jobs openings in nearly two years. And Bullard told me he didn't think that really sent much of a signal yet in terms of more balancing out in uh, supply and demand in the job market. So we'll see how the Fed views this uh, in your commentary this morning. Certainly, um, the unemployment rate implies that the job market is still quite tight, even though we saw a bit of cooling in the overall headline numbers. Back to you. All right, Jen, thanks so much. And certainly traders boosting their bets on a rate hike in May. All right, well, today's jobs report closely watched for the market for how it sets to guide the Fed's fight against inflation as rising interest rates really contributed to the regional bank collapses. Now, that instability shifting the views of some experts from a no-landing scenario for the U.S. economy 
to a hard landing. Joining us now with more, we want to bring in Torsten Slock, Apollo Global Management Chief Economist. Apollo Global Management is the parent company of Yahoo Finance. Torsten, it's great to see you here. So job growth cooling a bit, 236,000 jobs added. Unemployment, though, also ticking lower. What's your big takeaway and how the Fed is potentially looking at this report? Yeah, in some sense, this report on its own is indeed Goldilocks. Uh, we got lower inflation because wages came down to 4.2 from 4.6 last month. And we also at the same time had that employment growth came down from more than 300,000 last month to now 236. So in some sense, we still have an economy that's doing okay. And at the same time, inflation is coming down. That being said, the risk, of course, when you take a little bit further look back, is that employment growth has been declining quite substantially in the last three months. And it was already the effects of the Fed hiking rates that we are seeing in the labor market slowing. And if we add on top of that, the banking crisis that we're going through at the moment, then of course the risks are still there that the slowdown in the labor market over the next several months uh, can continue. So in other words, yes, um, so far so good. Uh, there are some issues also about other indicators, as Jen also just mentioned, that in particular the number of job openings have been declining a bit faster. Yesterday we got jobless claims, which was a little bit higher than what we would have expected. So all in all, the conclusion is that the labor market is cooling down. And the issue for the Fed still is that it needs to cool down in a gradual fashion over the next several months. And the risk is that the, whether that will happen or whether we might get a sharp or slowdown. It sounds really cool and measured when we say cool down, Torsten. But the reality of it is that the Fed is still going to be looking for where this bad data continues to show a trend over an extended period of time in order to hit some of their dual benchmark goals here. So how many consecutive months of bad or cooling data should we be expecting for the Fed to actually look for here? Yeah, there's a really important question. I think this week, at least, it did show uh, quite a downside surprise on a number of different fronts. We also got ISM services, which is the service sector that came in lower than expected. We also got ISM manufacturing, which was also lower than expected. Remember when ISM is below 50, that is by definition that the economy is in a recession. And on both fronts, we have seen a deterioration where both the service sector and the manufacturing sector, which are the two sectors in the economy, have been slowing down. So the impressive thing in this number is still that the labor market is still doing okay. Uh, there's still a lot of anecdotes about companies that are looking for workers, but there's certainly also more and more anecdotes. If you look at the, the warn notices, which is basically uh, companies have to tell you in advance if they lay off workers, that's been picking up. We've also seen, as I mentioned, jobless claims picking up, meaning the weekly data of how many people apply for unemployment benefits. That's also been softening. And overall, combined with fewer job openings, coming combined with the slowdown we saw in this number here for non-farm payrolls being weaker over the last few months, it still points to an economy that's slowing down. And that's not surprising. The whole idea from the Fed side is to raise interest rates, to slow down consumption, slow down cap spending, and slow down hiring. So we should expect that process to continue. The only issue now is, if we are adding on top of that a tightening in credit conditions, if it becomes harder to borrow money for your credit card or for buying a car or for buying for building skyscrapers and buying a, a factory equipment for companies, if those things slow down again over the next several months, we may run the risk that that slowdown could come a bit harder. And that means that, therefore, that the labor market could slow down faster. Yeah, Torsten, what did you make of Bullard's comments earlier this week? He was really downplaying the risk of a credit crunch. It sounds like maybe you're starting to see some signs of it, the potential fallout from that, and how significant that could be. Yeah, no, I'm quite worried that, I mean, some of the indicators that have come out since Silicon Valley Bank collapsed in early March, they do show that there's been quite a pullback in loan volumes. Specifically, the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas when they surveyed their district uh, from the 21st of March to the 29th of March, which was after Silicon Valley Bank failed, then they find that 71 banks and credit unions have seen a very significant reversal in loan volumes. In other words, lending to consumers, lending to corporates, lending to commercial real estate and residential real estate. So at least some of the indicators that have come out since Silicon Valley Bank have suggested that maybe the tightening in credit conditions, in particular for the regional banks, is more severe. Remember, the regional banks make up 30% of assets in the banking sector and 40% of lending in the banking sector. So the regional banks, they do play a quite significant role 
in the banking sector overall. And if they start to step a little bit harder on the brakes, that raises the risk of the economy, which was already slowing down, could potentially slow down a bit faster. Do you foresee a, a potential for a liquidity event, a massive liquidity event taking place in the back half of this year that would then push the Fed to pause or, or even cut rates? So I, I think that it is correct to say that the immediate risks in the banking sector are now over. Uh, what really is the key issue here is that there were some very intense um, things in the banking sector that played a very significant role in markets and everything we've been through for the last few weeks. But what is really critical for investors, and in particular for the S&P 500, is to now ask the question, what is going to be the behavioral change in the banking sector, most importantly in the regional banks, if the regional banks, again, which account for 40% of all lending in the banking sector, begin to pull back, if they stop lending to consumers, to corporates, to real estate, well, then you run the risk, of course, that the slowdown that is already coming because of the lag effects of Fed hikes might be coming a bit faster. So the risk from here is that I don't see as such a liquidity event, but I see that the Fed having already raised rates, and if you add on top of that, Banks that are tightening credit conditions, making it, making it harder to borrow, is, of course, a uh, risk to the downside. The next data point on this front here is that we will, on May the 9th, get the senior loan officer survey from the Fed. So that will tell you something about how much are the banks pulling back. But it's very clear that so far, at least the indicators we have up to this point, are suggesting a pullback and a continued deterioration in credit conditions in the banking sector. Thorsten, just lastly, while we have you, one of the charts that you had pointed out earlier this week, I actually got this from your newsletter, was the labor force participation rate and the potential for it actually being above the pre-pandemic marker. With the read that came in today, does any of this signal uh, that the labor force right now is, is seeing a massive slowdown, even though we are seeing some, some lightness in the number of ads month over month? Yeah, this is very, very important. So if you really step back and answer that question, then I think that we should be looking at, well, during the pandemic, we saw a significant hit to the labor market. There were 22 million people who lost their jobs in March and April of 2020. And we saw a significant reshuffle. Those people have now found jobs in all kinds of places. But we still have a significant amount that are outside the labor market relative to where we were before the pandemic. And the number we got today did show a tick up in the labor force participation rate. So the good news is that more people are coming back to the labor market, but that process, because it was simply so many, more than 20 million people, that process of getting people into the right jobs and the right places and getting people ultimately also back to the labor market is just taking time. And that has taken some time so far. And that is why the labor market still remains reasonably tight, simply because there were so many people who left during the pandemic and they are now gradually coming back. And that's, of course, why wage inflation is gradually, therefore, also moving lower, which is, of course, also good news from the Fed's perspective in terms of ultimately getting inflation down from currently the level of around numbers 5% inflation mm -hmm. back to that target of 2%. But it's going to take some more time before we get to that. Probably by the end of this year, things on the inflation front are going to look a lot better than where we are right now. All right. Well, that indeed is some good news on the inflation side. Torsten, thanks so much for taking some time here on this Jobs Friday with us. Torsten Slock, who is the Apollo Global Management Chief Economist. Appreciate it. And everyone, the jobs data taking center stage today. And before we send you off for the holiday weekend, here are three things that you need to know from Jobs Day. First off, the labor market remains tight as March numbers come in just above expectation. 236,000 non-farm payroll jobs were added in last month versus the 230,000 that were projected. That is down from a revised 323,000 in February. All of this means trouble for the Fed as they continue trying to fight inflation and decide whether or not to move on with rate hiking rates in their next meeting, which isn't until the beginning of May. We had RSM Chief Economist Joe Bruscellis on the show earlier today break down the numbers and the impact. Here's what he had to say. That means the Fed really will at in in a short period of time, be able to create a narrative whereby they can engage in a strategic pause. Brian, you're right. We're going to see a repricing of rate hikes. Those rate hikes, or excuse me, the rate cuts aren't going to happen this year, but maybe early next year. Second thing, unemployment down in March as it drops to 3.5% versus the 3.6% expected and the 3.6% from February with the decrease coming as labor force participation increased to its highest level since before the COVID pandemic. 
And finally, year-over-year -year wage growth coming in below the 4.3% expectations, just slightly. 4.2% in March was the year-over-year -year number, the average work week edging lower to 34.4 hours. All right, well, that does it for us today, but a couple of programming notes before we let, we let you go. Jennifer Schomberger will have an exclusive interview with New York Fed President John Williams. That's happening on Tuesday. You won't want to miss that. Plus, late to file your taxes. We will be speaking with experts all next week to break down your next steps. We'll be back with you 9 a.m. on Monday. Have a great weekend.